Boom, I know I can do it. Hello, everybody. It's the top of the hour. You're on Lunch Conversations of Randy and Teddy. And those who don't know, I am Teddy. The guy with the absolute gorgeous top of the head is Randy. And we will introduce you to our good friend, Wanda Swain, in a few moments. But hang on. For those who've never met me, I'm a, I, I'm a business strategist, trainer, and coach. All around, the use of LinkedIn as a business tool. I love to help uh, working for my wife. Love to help people figure out how to do that right. I had a guy send me a message this morning, and he wanted to have contract me to do ERC, uh, you know, tax credit stuff. But his LinkedIn profile said he's a real estate guy, had one connection, no content, and he's hitting mm. me up to sell. Don't be that. If you want help using LinkedIn, you need to talk to Teddy Burris. So, um, and um, so Randy's still looking at the screen. I bet he's yep. almost ready. Are we up and running, buddy? Yeah, yeah, all set now. I just. Just looked at both uh, Facebook and LinkedIn, so we're ready to roll. So I'll introduce myself and throw it back to you, Teddy, for more. But Randy Wooden with Goodwill Industries of Northwest North Carolina, director for our professional center. Yeah, we have a professional center. You don't necessarily always associate Goodwill with professionals, but they hired me in 2012 to start the very first, and we think only, standalone professional center for any Goodwill in the country. And so, uh, as you might expect, we help folks with a degree, or maybe they've been in a leadership salaried role, or or maybe owned a small company, that kind of a thing, and or you know, a recent grad. And there are plenty of those out there right now. So, uh, if you or somebody you know might be in a search, just reach out, find me on LinkedIn. Happy to help. We're free. Get you on the calendar and help get you where you want to go. But every Wednesday, Teddy and I get together, have a little fun, and learn things along the way. And today's going to be no exception as we uh, welcome Wanda back. And so, Teddy, I'll throw it back to you to get this thing started. I'll just cool. keep an eye on the, the chat area. If you have a comment or question for Wanda, put them in there. I'll keep an eye on that and work those in where appropriate. Cool, man. I got all my yep. ducks in a row here. By the way, Randy, we need to change your story around that you work for the professional center at, at Goodwill. And then you said that you didn't even think about the word professional at Goodwill. Mm -hmm. Anyway. <laughs> no, and you know, it's true. And it, quite honestly, it really is. Professionals yeah. don't associate necessarily getting help from Goodwill. And so that's always been a bit of a challenge, I get frankly, from a branding standpoint. And uh, yeah, yeah. Yep, so, so that's, yeah, it's something that we face, but uh, you know, happy to help and again get you on the calendar. And we're and we're happy to help with this yep. me the messaging you put in out there every, every week. So, yep. hey, look, Wanda Swain and I have been friends for 10, 15 years, something right. like that. We used to get together in, in Greensboro and a, another group of really smart coaches and hang out there. Um, and uh, I, I love Wanda's bio. I'm going to, I'm going to paraphrase and read it to you. I'm, I'm not going to tear it apart one. I'm going to, I'm going to paraphrase it as I read it. A former high school English teacher, just like Randy's mama. Yeah. You know? How about that? Huh? <laughs> Organize, organizational development director, HR mm -hmm. professional, and an entrepreneur has her own business. Uh, lots of experience in education, leadership development. I mean, I got to make the screen bigger to get all this in front of me here. Involved in you know education, manufacturing, healthcare environments. Uh, Wanda eats, drinks, and sleeps HR, including the really important stuff in HR. You know, professional development and this conversation we're going to have today about. EQ, emotional quotient or emotional intelligence. Uh, uh, Wanda was the past president of the Triad Coaching Connection, where we used to hang out. And she's also a mentor for UNCG Bryan School of Business MBA capstone program. So, Wanda, did I do that okay? That was beautiful. I'm impressed with me too. How about that? <laughs> Good to meet you, Wanda. What did I not okay. share about you that the audience absolutely needs to know? Uh, I'm a bass guitarist with a <laughs> band. Uh, I left that one for you. Yeah. Look in, look I, in the I, back. I think I see it. Well, that's my that's my regular acoustic guitar. Okay. Uh, I, you know, it helps me be creative. Music is uh, one of those things that taps into your your brain and helps you to unlock other places. I'm sure some of your audience. Uh, can appreciate the fact that when you really want to get creative, you turn music on and it's, it can really change uh, 
emotions as well as intelligence. Uh, but yeah, uh, I do play uh, for for several years. I was the in the Alive Band at Tabernacle United Methodist Church there in Greensboro. And then when we moved here to Hampstead, I'm acclimating our present congregation into the fact that someone of my uh, hair color can actually get down on the bass. Uh, uh, yeah. I, I, love, there you I go. love it. I love it. So, uh, well, you know, Teddy, and it'll jump in here with the inevitable why question I ask it every week. And you're passionate about what you do, been doing it for a long time. Was What's your why? How did it get started? What, what brought you down this path? Well, you know, I think it, I think it really has to do with the fact that I chose teaching as a profession. I uh, went to UNCG, graduated from their School of, uh, of uh, Education, um, English teacher for, for years. And when I decided I wanted to make more money than teaching would, would allow me to, because the toys I wanted cost more than what I could, could have as a teacher. Um, and I, uh, I found that with training and development being under the HR umbrella that going into human resources allowed me to continue that passion. Um, yeah, the, my acumen, and that's a word that we will use uh, as we talk about uh, mm -hmm. emotional intelligence, uh, I don't have an acumen for LinkedIn like Teddy does. And I don't have an acumen for compensation and payroll and benefits in the HR world. Uh, that's not that's not my you know forte. It's my skill set is another, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, my acumen in the HR world is in policies, procedures, strategic planning, and training and development. So I love helping people be better. Yeah, got you. Yeah, got you. Well, let's uh, let's get her started. Uh, Teddy, what you got? So, um, hey, want to talk a little bit big picture about who you serve? I mean, we're going to talk mm -hmm. about EQ. Uh, but, I, you know, put it in a little bit of context about who is it that you serve? Uh, and I, I think the answer is going to be a broad answer before we talk about what it is that you do. Okay. Um, anybody who has a bank account. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. I've been around Teddy for 15 years, right? Uh, you should have known that was coming. I... I have a relationship with the community colleges and uh, as such, I, uh, as a third party vendor for the community colleges business and industry, mm -hmm. I am introduced to lots and lots of manufacturing um, organizations uh, who, who use uh, the community colleges as a, a resource for mm -hmm. their training and development. Um, when I go in to do leadership training uh, as part of the community college, I meet, I meet the people. So uh, usually uh, they reach out to me for uh, executive coaching as a follow-up to some of the training. And just over the 10 years that I've run my business, uh, I have a reputation in the state of North Carolina. So it's, it's uh, just about any, in, any industry yeah. uh, mm -hmm. and uh, word of mouth. Uh, so that's, I don't know if that completely answered your question, but yeah. yeah. Got, yeah. It, it, I mean, I think that uh, you answered, it, you know, with, you know, you're there to help people, but you get invited to help people through those that know you, which are community colleges and, and manufacturing industries, which, you know, I've done some work in the manufacturing industry. It's, it, there's a lot of work to be done there, a whole lot of work to be done because it used to be that, um, and it's not so much anymore that in the manufacturing industry, people were trained with a, with a hammer and a stick. And, um, and that didn't, that doesn't work anymore. It really yeah. does. You know, uh, leadership is the same no matter what industry you're in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how we relate to to people, you know, the, and that kind of goes to that. Um, uh, we the difference, you know, our our intelligence versus our emotions. When we're in leadership, is more of an emotional uh, type mm. session to uh, or skill to the industry which has more to do with our intelligence uh in the that genre yeah, yeah. Uh, i i get it yeah so all right so we're going to talk about eq and 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 this i can i can tell our audience you know uh, you know some of these guys know you you know um, um our buddy greg is on here um michael's on here we're going to talk about eq emotional 
quotient, emotional intelligence. So Wanda, define that for people like me. Okay, well, yeah, I wrote down the definition. Look, she got her school mom glasses yes. on, dude. <laughs> the measure that your EQ is the measurement of your ability to sense, understand, and effectively apply the power and acumen of your and others' emotions. Wait, so, sense, and what was the second word? Uh, understand. I think that's where I screw up. Yeah, so under, being able to say, what am I feeling mm -hmm. at any given time and recognize that something just shifted my emotions and I recognize they shifted and going, okay, I my emotional intelligence is being able to recognize that. That just ticked me off or, or that, just, that just caused me to be absolutely elated or I am in euphoria, I, whatever, right? Mm -hmm to be able to recognize, but then to understand why and what was it that took you there? That trigger, what, what is that? So, Does it also extend to the people that you work with to be able to recognize when they Absolutely. have changed and, and so forth? So this is not just a me thing. It's, it, it's how we engage with other people too. Yeah. The best example I can give mm -hmm. you to picture this is the courtroom yeah. scene of A Few Good Men. When Tom Cruise was being baited throughout his, you know, he finally throughout the movie got to his self-awareness and self-regulation point so that no matter what Colonel Jessup threw at him, he had one mission. That was his motivation, which was one of the dimensions of EQ. And he was able to sense what the other person was feeling through his responses and actually take it regulate that to the point what his overarching goal was to get him to admit he ordered the code red right mm -hmm. so it's like don't get sides being emotional and intelligence helps you to keep your eye on the ball to keep mm -hmm. focused on what what is my overarching goal in any situation and sometimes we have bunches of them going on at the same time mm -hmm. that's where true leadership comes to be able to shift from that Okay, I'm a father, but yes, I'm also the CEO and CFO or whatever it happens to be. Hmm. You know, and, and in, in this conversation, if I'm really wanting to pay attention to how we are doing, because we're we're producing something right now, I got to pay attention to what Wanda's saying with her face and words, what Randy is saying with his face, and I got to be paying attention to the chat to see if what our audience is saying. And I'm saying this is a very simple scenario in real life. We're sitting at the Thanksgiving dinner table, you know, and uh, and we got to be paying attention to what Aunt Myrtle says and what Uncle Ralph is doing, et cetera, et cetera. It's hard work. But the more we pay it, as I'm hearing you say, Wanda, the more we can pay attention so that we can sense it and understand it. And apply it. And, yeah, oh, wow, wow, crap. Then there's that apply part. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I get it. And this is the our, our emotional intelligence or the ability for us to do that is all wrapped up in our emotional quotient. How much acumen, how much are we able to do this all at once? Mm -hmm. Did I say that right? You did. All I right. have a test for that. Yeah. But by, by the way, somebody keeps score that I'm paying attention and catching on. Okay. Right. All right, Wanda, you told me, and this is a little different for me. I did not realize this until you and I were talking about it, but you told me there are five dimensions to our EQ. Right. Yes. I'm like, God, don't you're making it even harder for old men like me. So break this down for our for our audience. What are the five dimensions of EQ? And, mm -hmm. and, and and big picture how they work. Okay. So I uh, in, in two different genres, you have uh, yourself and you have others, sort of to Randy's point a few moments ago. Yeah. So when it comes to our self, our emotional intelligence, the, the three dimensions are self-awareness, being aware of your emotions and how they impact you and others in any given situation. 
Then your self-regulation is how well you regulate those emotions. What do you do about it when you recognize what you, you're aware of what you're feeling? Now, what do I do about it? Mm-hmm. And then the third piece for self is your motivation. And I mentioned that before, which is your overarching goal. That is your, your you know, what do I want to achieve uh, in any given situation? A conversation, interaction, uh, event. It's your motivation. The other two dimensions are about others. Social awareness. What is the other person feeling? What might they be feeling in this moment? And then what, you know, why might they be feeling and how's it impacting them? And then the, the social regulation is that ability. And this is really where true leadership comes in uh, to how can I help regulate what they're feeling to bring them to a place where we actually accomplish what we're here to accomplish. And, and all of these are important. And, and when we, it's not like we have to have a playbook with this, as right. I'm understanding it, but we have to understand this. You know, the emotional uh, emotional intelligence, we got we to gotta look at, it's sort of like driving a car. You need to know where the clutch is. You need to know where the brake is. You, and by the way, you don't always need to brake. That's a whole other story. You need to know the gas pedal. You got the steering wheel. You, you got your passengers, which by the way, I just did a 2,000 mile road trip. So I, I, this, this is very apropos, you know, because I had two passengers and you got all the people around you. And so <laughs> we, we didn't wreck Wanda, but I scared some people. <laughs> Well, Ever yeah. a dull moment, right? Last time I was on, mm-hmm. uh, we talked about uh, DISC, our behavior styles. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and for emotional, for emotional intelligence, when you, when you say, you know, so it's not rocket science, we, all, we, we deal with it all the time. You know, some of us are really good at some behavior styles mm-hmm. do much better with the regulation of it. You know, ah. so, than, than other behavior styles. Uh, we can talk about the past president of the United States, if you'd like. Does, it, it's like, when you think about characters that we all know, if I were to ask you and Te, uh, you and uh, Randy, Teddy mm-hmm. and Randy, to switch behavior styles, I'd like for Randy to be Teddy and Teddy to be Randy. Well, that's going to be a cluster. <laughs> that, do you realize what the ch- what changes in your behaviors you would have to go through? Randy's more introvert in his mannerisms than <laughs> you're very expressive in yours. So, and so when we're p- applying mm-hmm. that to emotional intelligence, so often those of us who are ex- extroverts have to do a little more regulating to make sure that we don't express everything we're feeling and put it out there <laughs> all at one time. Yeah. And, and Randy won't Randy won't <laughs> wear a pair of glasses and have a pair of glasses hooked to his shirt. <laughs> and Josh, uh, Josh is on here, so that'd be interesting. <laughs> it ain't happening, dude. We're not going to do that role play. But but I'm with you. Why not? Uh, yeah, I, I get why DISC is so relevant to EQ. Sure. Uh, um, so, uh, hey, look, if you guys have any questions or thoughts about this, jump in and, and ask us any question. Uh, let's, let's take for a minute. And and uh because who asks this? Dale asks this, Randy will pull it up. No, okay. Dale says, you know, emotional intelligence is a favorite topic again. He 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 believes that it's a key factor in hiring Gen Y and Gen Z in modern tech organizations. And um and and he wants to ask Wanda, do you feel that certain professions are more acclimated to EI than others? What do you think? Um, I, 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 ooh, that's a, that's an interesting question. Yeah. Uh, all all professions uh, need uh, a certain amount of emotional intelligence. I mean, so I think about you know for the longest time I was the VP of HR for um, for several years, the VP of HR for an anesthesia management company where most of my employees were CRNAs and and anesthesiologists. Emotional intelligence is extremely important when you are in surgery for most of your working day. Uh, so, so physicians, uh, people who have highly um, uh, volatile type situations, uh, emotional intelligence can be extremely important. Um, mm-hmm. 
as an HR professional, one of the things that really drew me into emotional intelligence was realizing that when we're in the hiring process, it's not enough just to make sure you understand somebody's resume. It's important to find out if they have the emotional acumen to actually handle the kind of work. So to, is it Doug who, who asked that question? To, to uh, uh, question Dale, I think. To Dale, to Dale's question, uh, you know, that his point, yes, there, we as, as hiring managers, as HR professionals, uh, leaders who are actually interviewing candidates, owe it to the people that are sitting in front of us to help them to understand what kind of emotions are needed in the job that they're applying for. And, and we know it much better than the candidate does. Yes. So that's why good questions and good hiring uh, scenarios. Have you seen the Heineken's job interview, the candidate? Uh, there's a video, if you haven't mm. seen it, uh, it's, it's, it's several years old now, but they actually do an emotional intelligence interview uh, where they uh, are testing the emotions of the candidate and how well they respond in certain situations and how they can regulate their own emotions. It's, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll, I'll look that up and see if I can share that. Randy? We have, uh, Dale followed up with a question about, uh, well, and, and also Yosa chimed in. He just said he wrote an ebook about customer service centers. And um, I mean, if you're on the phone all day with ticked off customers, and I would think, understanding how to control your own emotions and how to deal with theirs. That's got to be a key thing. Uh, might that be one of the areas where it's maybe even more important, even if you're not in leadership roles? Um, I, I missed, I missed, missed the question. question. Yeah. So, and I'm kind of making this up as I go. So we're, in some ways you're talking about as a leader and and having a team and being able to to work with that but what about if i'm sitting there and manning the phone and i get incoming calls in a in a call center customer service center from people with problems or who are irritated at whatever so i'm dealing not necessarily as a manager to my 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 team but just dealing with external customers that are have you know are not happy let's put it that way uh, is that something that i guess if you had to look at different job categories? Would that be a job category where that e EQ would be perhaps even more important than maybe other ones? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know that any one is more important than another. I, I think about the times that I've gone up to the cash register to pay for an item, yeah. only to have the phone ring and the salesperson doesn't look at me and go, I'm so sorry, excuse me, I, I'm required to answer this. But they just turn around and answer the phone and they're talking and you're sitting there going and you want to say, could, could you could you get me somebody who actually knows what they're doing <laughs> or who actually cares about the customer? And so sometimes the customer has no emotional intelligence or has uh, yep. their social awareness and regulation is not so good. But that customer service person could also exercise some emotion and it's important for how they respond to that. Like, I can understand how you feel, how you, and I apologize deeply for that. That's regulation, you know, when mm -hmm. you actually acknowledge and, you know, empathy, putting yourself in the other person's shoes. So I, I think all jobs require uh, their own a level or mm -hmm. set of emotional um, factors. But another question too that, that came up regarding interview questions. Mm -hmm. Are there certain ones that you found to be more effective maybe than others in terms of assessing EI? No, I think uh, it's very important to ask behavioral mm -hmm. questions based on your knowledge of the industry okay. that you're in. Let, let's, uh, let's pick that one up in a minute, Wanda, because that, that'll play well with one of my points I wanted to make sure I ask you about. Gotcha. Okay. okay. All right. Um, uh, by the way, I think based on this conversation and what I've been learning over the years, that I think emotional intelligence is a human thing. And the more humans understand their emotional quotient and use emotional intelligence, the better society will be. Well, let's move on to this next question. IQ, <laughs> I mean, that's my blunt rant about that. IQ, our, in, our intelligence quotients is important. Mm -hmm. But when you and I were talking, you said EQ is vital. Yes. 
Oh, look, she didn't back off that, did she? Mm -mm, Not at all. (laughs) Talk about that a little bit, would you? Uh, So um, your capacity for learning, for knowledge, is what is measured with your IQ. Your IQ can grow over time. Uh, Some of us grow it at a slower rate than others. So I believe that I am smarter and have a higher IQ now. That she's I am, looking at me, uh, Betty. She's looking at me when she said that. I, uh, I, then, and I was in a ch- as a child when I first took my first IQ uh, test in the second or third grade or whatever grade it is that uh, back in the day they did that. Your your IQ helps to know uh, how fast you learn and process knowledge. Uh, what's what's your capacity for learning? Uh, your EQ is about your emotions. It's it's how you react to those things, uh, to 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 life. Uh, so, um, for example, you need a certain IQ to go into certain professions, such as as law, uh, because of the amount of knowledge that needs to be processed at any one uh, particular time. And and I, I I I understand this because I at one time applied to law school. And it was, you know, there's the, the uh, certain uh, score you had to make on the LSAT, a certain this, et cetera. It's, it's very, your IQ is extremely important in certain jobs yeah. uh, because of the rapid uh, amount of knowledge you have to process at any given time. Other, you don't have to process it much. Doesn't mean that you don't, uh, you know, IQ isn't important, but mm-hmm. that ability to, uh, uh, to process information, that's your There's IQ. There's always better ways to dig a ditch. And there's also always better ways of being an anesthesiologist. Yes. So in an emotional quotient, your emotional intelligence is about, am I aware of what I'm feeling and how what I'm feeling is is impacting this particular moment Um, and and particular and others? Uh, Can I regulate what I'm feeling? have you ever been in a situation where you said, I know I shouldn't say this, but, and then you say it anyway? Never, Wanda, never. <laughs> that, that, is, that is your prime example of self-aware. I know I shouldn't say this. And then self-regulation would be, so I'm not going to say it. Yeah. And, instead of, I know I shouldn't say this, but. Right. Yeah. And. And and as you practice that, you never say, I know I shouldn't say it. You go, mm, yeah. this is time for me to be quiet, nonverbal, yeah. but still look like I'm engaged and happy to be here. Yeah, yeah. So. Until you can find the right words to say to change the conversation or to move along. Yeah, well, what is my purpose here? What's my really, overarching goal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I told you one, a, a while back when we talked, I told you sometimes my purpose was misdirected mm-hmm. or was inappropriate. And I had to learn that I needed to change my purpose in order to be a better human. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was, you seek to understand and be understood. So it's, you, you yeah. got to listen to what other people are saying, ideally, I would think, yeah. versus this is the way it's going to be. So, right. good stuff. so let's so let's let's let, we're, we're, let's talk about uh, the uh, the hiring process. So let, let's let, let's let's pull in Dale's question. What are some good? What's a good interview question to be able to assess someone's um, uh, EQ? You can assess someone's EQ with just about any interview question. Let's say, for example, uh, I I am asking you the question: If you were an animal. <laughs> What animal would you be? And you're sitting across the table and you're thinking, I'm so sorry, but what does that question have to do with me getting this job? That tells me something about your emotional intelligence. Yeah, yeah. The, the, um, you see that Dale said, for some reason, other Dale personally knows that manatee is not the right answer. I'm not sure why. Um, but you could make manatee the answer if your job is is you know like you are you know the bounty hunter uh, it might be important that you i am able i will I pick you know a vicious whatever or a something that could sting extremely if you apply it to the job it's how you answer certain questions 
that is the, the reason for the question being asked sometimes. Um, just, um, you know, asking. Uh, well, I, I, why, part of, I'll tell you, when I worked for a guy who ran a $100 million Olson staffing division, and his favorite question is, was, I don't know if he still uses it now, is if you could be a tree, what kind of tree would you be and why? And people, and I got people all over the interview space, you know, the recruiters and hiring managers and professionals that go, that's a stupid question. Well, it's just a way to play with people yeah. to see how they respond. Well, yeah. it's interesting that you would bring that question because I was asked that question when, in a job interview uh, for an HR professional position. And, and I said, one that really can bend in the wind. Because my job here is going to be to interpret policy, to write and interpret policy. And I have to be able to be flexible and understand all situations. So I would pick the tree that doesn't break during the storm. Yeah. Just applying it back to the job, showing that I can make some kind of connection, can make, can make a difference instead of going, oh, dear God, what kind of question is that? Ooh, you know, instead yeah. of losing it, go, wow. Yeah, for this particular job, you'd need a tree that, and it's not so much the tree you pick as it is how you explain the tree. how your story goes. Yeah. yeah, Eddie, we're halfway through. If uh, yeah. you want to yeah. take the, oh, uh, this is cool. I, I I love chatting with you because you, you you make hey. me think and you give me stuff to work on. Hey, you're on lunch conversations with Randy and Teddy. Our special guest today is my good friend Wanda Swain. The conversations about emotional intelligence and how that is important for all humans, regardless what their job or role or, is all about. Uh, and, and my cohort uh, partner in crime is my Mr. Randy Wooden. And we appreciate everybody who shows up uh, in our audience and watches live. And so, um, all right, um, employers are looking for candidates um, who had the right IQ, had the right experiences, et cetera, et cetera. But they also want candidates who really, this is it really, exude, present, demonstrate that they've got the right EQ. Am I saying that right? That sounds beautiful. I love that. <laughs> You're hired. I, I scripted it last night. Exude. Um, I have the imagery with exude is nice. Yeah. Well, I appreciate the fact earlier when you were talking about negative and positive of people, you, you talked about this negative piece, and then you talked about lots of positive words. And I'm like, wow, she didn't go deep into the negative side. She went deep into the positive side. So I'm learning from you, dear. So is this real? I mean, are recruiters, hiring managers, business owners understanding enough about the importance to be looking that way for those those skills, EQ skills? I don't think enough. Ah. I, I, I believe that, that we could do a better job or I'm, I'm hoping that we can do a better job. As I, as I teach HR law and go into organizations and, and help with leadership training and development and I get asked these questions, you know, we hire these Gen Zers and these uh, Gen Xers and they're, they stay 10 minutes, they'll leave for, you know, a dollar more, they're not interested in investing in their, uh, in retirement accounts, and, and I'm, you know, you, I think to myself, well, what are they looking for? Do you ask them the right questions? Are you, are you finding out why they picked your company to come and apply for a job? Or are we, are we investing in understanding that, the opportunities that were out there for the the boomers, they're not there for um, this this generate. The world is not the same. It wasn't the same for us as it was for the generations or two of, uh, before yeah. boomers. So, uh, I, it's important for hiring managers to to really get to ask the questions that tap into the emotions of the people that are are sitting in front of them. Um, yeah. Yeah, I love the way you. I love the way you said. I hope we do a better job. And that, that I expect that of you, and you share you and you demonstrate that consistently. But I also like the fact that you. I mean, the words you said. They don't ask. Mm -hmm. They go. They go through their checklist. Do you have this skill? This skill? Have you been doing this? Okay, good. Get your get your boots on. 
and, and they don't try to understand. And by the way, want to help me with this right or wrong? I don't think it's just Gen Z and Gen X. I think it's the Wanda's, the Teddy's, and the Randy's of the world today as well, uh, because we're look we are all looking for something different. Is that do you see that? Well, you know, even even on the job. So if I were still working for an employer and, and not for myself, but you know, even on the job, it's very important for us to realize that each task or each goal that we have assignment we were given, we have to align on do we have the skills? It's a Blanchard concept, but do we are, do our, are we well developed in the skill? How developed are we in the skill to this goal? And what kind of leadership do I need to help me to achieve that goal? It doesn't matter how old you are or how young you are. It's important to align on what is being asked of me and how much direction do I need? Sometimes we, we take someone who knows very well what to do. They could do it in their sleep and we micromanage them. Mm. Uh, or we take someone who has no idea what to do and say, hey, you wanted this job, run with it. And but I don't know what to do. So it's important to assess and align our where is that person in actually do achieving that goal or task. And, and our emotions are attached to every single bit of that. Mm -hmm. uh, more people get terminated because their emotions got the best of them than because the skill set was not there. Yeah. That's never happened to me. <laughs> yeah. it's because you got to them first <laughs> I think that has happened to me and mm -hmm. the, my emotions told me to get the heck out yes but I couldn't because I couldn't fix that problem that I that I was dealing with i.e business owner it, 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 but this you know I get it you know we need to discover more more about is this the right fit for this person and is it is it fair to think is it the right fit socially is it the right fit you know for that regarding this the task regarding the skills regarding the uh the uh, um you know their iq is it the right fit i mean should i put teddy burris in a retail environment you know it, it, he knows he knows the product he knows tools he knows plumbing and electrical but will teddy burris be happy in a retail environment so, so let me let me and I, and I may be going off on a, the wrong tangent here, but I'm I'm assuming that your audience knows Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Let's, okay. let's, let maybe touch on it quickly. So, so Maslow's hierarchy of needs pretty much says that at the base level is like we what we're our needs are our survival, right? Safety, security, food shelter and then the Internet. next rung up you know maybe maybe uh some creature comforts you know warm blanket to go with that shelter the next one up is you know the, the car <laughs> you know in the house uh the next one up you know the, the big job yeah. you know we're not worried about eating sleeping shelter security we're now thinking about uh actualization and then the very top one is self-actualization where so, so when you go in to apply for a job, so much depends on where you are on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And when you talk about Teddy being, you know, I just can't see me doing certain things. Well, if you were at the bottom rung of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, mm. you didn't have that nice little office with the cute little lights around the back there, and you were figuring out, you know, where am I gonna sleep tonight? Where's my next meal coming from? Oh, yes, I'm a great person for this job. I don't care if I don't have any idea what you're talking about. I need food, shelter, yeah. security. So our emotional, where we are emotionally is for us to be able to say, what am I feeling? Why am I feeling it? And how is it impacting me? What could or should I do about it? Why should or shouldn't I? And how is it going to bring me closer? And there's just so many variables there that the more emotionally intelligent you are, the, the more you're aware of, I can get a, a job, but getting the right job, I'm going to be happy and content. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I, 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 I agree that 
all of that applies. But at a certain point, you know, I can get, I can get a retail job at, at Chick-fil-A or a retail job at Lowe's Home Improvement. Where will I be more successful? Because I, I enjoy it. And, and, I, but, and I truly get the fact that some of us got to take a job. But at, sure. a, some, at a certain point, and I think more with our audience, at a certain point, we can make decisions about where we don't want to be. Yeah. But we may believe that this is a good place for us to be. And I think it, it behooves a hiring manager to ask the right questions to discover, will, will Teddy Burris be happy at, a, at Lowe's Home Improvement working a retail job? And I think, as you said, I don't think enough hiring managers are asking emotional intelligence, emotional questions to discover that. Yeah. It, you know, just a, a, out of curiosity, if the employer says, why would you like to work here? Might that be a way to kind of lead the, the witness, so to speak, or to, to have the candidate be able to articulate why they want to work there and, it, and it, it display their passion, that kind of a thing? Is that a good question or is that just so such a standard by it's the book they've been asking question. generation? It's an excellent question, but be prepared to process the answer. Okay. It's very important for if you ask that question, are you also going to take when they said, you know, I just need a job yep. to ask a follow up question. Once that once we've met your needs for, you know, are you still going to be happy when we get you? Because I want you to be here to up to self-actualization. I am wanting to make you a manager of this place. So let me ask the follow up question that says so. So now let's talk about some of the tasks you'll be asked to do you know, what is your excitement, your level of interest in these types of things? Just to, you know, be able to process their answer to, to not just go, oh, they're just looking for a buck. No, if they are on that bottom rung, of course they are. Yeah. But, but follow up with that neck when they answer the question to be able to actually process their, their answer and and formulate, is this going to be a good fit once they hit yeah. that that first level yeah. and that takes a lot of work and so and that's a by the way we're going off knee deep into that whole world of you know sitting yeah. in a recruiter's chair and, and that can uh, again be All a right. lot of conversation hey wanda let's do this let's talk about my favorite conversation okay alice in wonderland and cheshire chat okay so t t okay. talk about that tell me tell us how that story applies to this whole conversation well i i i use alice uh, a lot of times when I'm teaching emotional intelligence in, in companies, when I go in and we're doing assessments and, and we're talking about it, but because Alice at one point says, or it was Carol and his says, I knew who I was this morning, but I've changed a few times since then. Mm -hmm. And, and I love that quote from that book because it is so applicable to absolutely every single one of us. We get up in the morning and you know, uh, applying Covey's uh, 90 10 principle, where 10% of life is what happens to us, and 90% is how we react to it. Mm -hmm. uh, that speaks directly to our emotional intelligence. One little trigger somebody say the wrong thing, uh, the conversation go to a, a topic that's not something that you that triggers some emotion in you. Mm -hmm. And if we don't get a handle on our emotions, we can go into what we call an amygdala hijack. Uh, the amygdala is that little almond shaped primitive brain uh, gland that is there that um, your mother told you to count to 10. When you get, you know, if you get angry, count to 10, one, two, it's really six. In six seconds, your, the, the um, hormones that are produced from the amygdala replicate so if you can stop if you can catch that hijack within that first six seconds you can usually get your emotions under control so you know your amygdala is the one that says i'm going to fight fly or freeze mm -hmm. and you never know which one's going to show up uh mm -hmm. you know you've seen beauty pageants where the the contestants ask the question and suddenly she's gibberish uh, it's, it freezes, right? Sure. Or sometimes you, someone you think would have stay power, they fly, they, they 
their their emotional reaction is to run. And then you have that person who bring it on, the, the, the fight. So, but if you can get those emotions under that amygdala hijack, contain that, you know, I knew who I was this morning, but things have changed because we have triggers all throughout the day and we have to make those emotional decisions to, I'm going to, I know where that came from. I can process it. Let me put that up. It's not this thing. It's that other thing. So let me get back to this thing. Yeah. It's not. Yeah. And then the other uh, Alice quote that I love has to do with our motivation, which is when she asked the Cheshire cat, which, so which way ought I go? And he says, well, where do you want to, where do you want to end up? And she said, well, I don't know. He said, well, then any road will take you there. And, and to our, if we don't know what our overarching goal is in any conversation, like we, we sit down to have an interview with someone and we don't know exactly what we're looking for. Or if we go to an interview and we don't even know what the company is about and we get asked that question, mm -hmm. we can have an emotional uh, amygdala hijack one. What, what do y'all do here? <laughs> you know, uh, it's important to, to, to know what it is. You have your overarching uh, goal. What is your motivation? Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, I, I, I love these stories because... Um, because they're real life. I mean, you know, Lewis Carroll knew what he's doing. He's putting it all together. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah. Gloria, good point. Gloria dropped in that you know it's important for us to be open about innovation and diversity, and uh, and it's also important as a you know as a business owner uh, looking for resources, looking for partnership, and or looking for employees. To be a, to be aware of that too, or the, do these people do they align with our uh, with with our culture? And and by the way, that can be a double edged sword. <laughs> you know, it can be a bad thing as well as a good thing. Um, and and today we have to all be paying attention to that. So thank thank you, Gloria, for dropping that in. And um, I love that. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> all right. How do I determine, we've got a few more minutes here. We're good. How can I determine what triggers set me off? We, we have patterns. Oh, that's right. That's right. Our patterns. patterns. Yes. Uh, I, I know when we had our initial conversation, I asked you, do you have a sibling? Our Did sibling? I answer that question, by the way, Wanda? <laughs> I don't remember. Ask I, have, to, I, have fifth, I have uh, 14. Ask them to name them all right away. <laughs> so, so, so our, and I, I asked that because those are the, from our childhood, these are the people who know what buttons to push. They, they know us better than we know ourselves. And we get into these patterns. And I can remember my younger sister, for example, and I, she knows exactly how to push my buttons. And get me into an amygdala hijack. I mean, we we can love each other, and one minute and the next minute we are ready to. And she, she used to come visit with me, and like whenever she was happy and everything was great, she'd she'd start that fight. She would say that thing that caused just you know, and next thing you know, she's packed her bags and off she goes. And then it's like, oh, I'm so sorry, and everything's it's siblings, right? You know, how, what you see determines what you do, which determines what you get. It's a, you know, Covey see, do, get model. Yeah. You, you know, our paradigm, how we see a situation impacts. So we have our mental models. And then so we do these things. That's how our patterns get going. You know, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you always got. So when I was at my daughter's wedding, she got married in Rome and I posted a picture of all of us in, uh, at one of the turtle, the turtle fountain. Some of you may know the Bernini's turtle fountain and the whole family was there and I was wearing a dress and you know, when everybody's putting their arms around each other, sometimes when you're wearing a dress, it can make you look, you know, your dress can poof, poof out anyway. So I posted the picture and my sister Oops. here in the United States, she posts in response to the picture. She says, what were you thinking wearing that dress? <laughs> so you know, I had tagged all the people in the picture there. So, you know, millions of people had, were seeing this picture. I mean, I'm having a lady ego here, but so I, I'm looking at this and I go, 
if I see this the way I've always seen it, I will do what I've always done and I'm going to get what I've always got. So I'm going to use some emotional intelligence here and choose to see this. What were you thinking wearing that dress? Wow, what a great choice that was. So I responded to her post going, I know it's Italian linen. Isn't it beautiful? And she writes back, yes, Wanda, it is. I get a messenger message from about 15 of my friends going, I don't think that's what she meant. <laughs> and I go, maybe not, but I changed the pattern. There you go. And so often in, in emotional intelligence, it's important for us to realize that how we think determines what we feel and what we feel determines how we act. So we have to really watch our thoughts, watch our feelings, and watch our actions, and any one of them can start the circle. Does that make sense? It does. Ron, I'm trying to remember, did I give you my visa or my American Express for this coaching? Um, I, 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 I take PayPal, PayPal. yeah. <laughs> Don't take a check from him, just so I'm saying. <laughs> it's, it's powerful stuff. Powerful. Yeah, and it, and it all starts with that, you know, the sensing, that understanding, and then understanding how to apply. Mm -hmm. What should I do? What should I do next, Teddy? And I don't know if I told you, that's also the reason why I wore out my backspace key. <laughs> yeah. We don't, wouldn't it be nice if life came with an eraser? Right? <laughs> yeah, we, Wait a minute, I can, I can play with that one in lots of ways, too. But, you know, in golf, if you have but. <laughs> Uh, but in life, uh, you know, our tongue cuts like a two-edged sword. We we can't talk our way out of things we behave ourselves into. It's um, and it's hard good. to go back if you would have responded to your sister. By the way, I've met your sister, and I have always, when I met her, she struck me as the most loving, caring person. I never saw that other side of her. Uh, but but what? what oh uh, wow i lost my train of thought here i mean it all it all comes back to purpose what is our purpose what is our purpose of what we say our purpose of what we do what are we trying to achieve and when we want to be better humans we will change what our purpose is and again i'm very clear about this because i remember in the early days of social media i came up with the phrase and i use even today social media is a great place for us to destroy relationships easily quickly destroy relationships because we want to respond and jab back at them as hard as we thought they were jabbing at us mm -hmm. and and this whole conversation you know is relevant to we can use social media not to destroy relationships yeah we, um. And, 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 you know, the social awareness and social regulation piece is so overlooked in our society. It's so important to, to try to understand, you know, because social awareness is empathy. Yeah. Can I, can I, can I see this situation the way you're seeing it? That's, it doesn't mean I have to agree. Yeah. With, uh, it doesn't mean I have to uh, uh, not realize, hey, you know, you, you did this to yourself, but I go, wow, this must be difficult for you. And I've had conversations with people before when I say, boy, I've had a really bad day. To open the door for them and say, oh, gee, it sounds like things are kind of bad. No, their response is, well, you think your day was bad. You should have been at my last. And all of a sudden it was about them. Uh -huh. And you're, you realize I'm just nothing. My conversation didn't matter. It's, and we have to be very careful about that with our in emotion. Whenever we have that opportunity, when someone opens that door, you think that, well, you know, they don't they talk about their emotions, but they come home and say, boy, I've had a bad day. It's not, it's more like, hey, you want to hear about my day? Yeah. You know, and so you go, wow, sounds like things were pretty bad today. Just replay, just mirror back what they've said. And then usually you'll have that conversation and keep it about them. That's that social awareness. And then they might say, so what do you think I ought to do about it? Now you've got the opportunity for the regulation and go, well, if you really are asking for my opinion, yeah. you know, 
that's that's when that's when they've opened the door for some regulation or you can ask the right questions to pull it in. Is this a Venus and Mars kind of thing? Because guys want to fix stuff. So as soon as somebody says something, guy guy will jump in and say, well, this is what you need to do. And and the other person isn't asking for the solution. They want to be heard. Right. And hey, Randy, I'm not paying you for coaching. All right. <sighs> I tried. You were at, you, I think you're absolutely right. And and it's not necessarily, you know, not to just make it a gender thing, but I think so many times, often, a lot of us, some of our behavior styles, my, my, uh, my dominance score is pretty high. So I like to fix things. I like to, look, let's just get, let's fix it, move on. You know? yep. And that's not all, you know, my husband's who's an engineer, very process oriented. Sometimes I say, well, if, if, if you could just tell me Give me the suggestion. Let me do it. I don't need you to do it. Yeah. Let's yeah. talk through this. And I'm like, got it. Friend, uh, um, Wanda, this is great. We could, we could go on way more. I really appreciate it. Uh, I really, I, lo I love sh uh, you showing up and sharing with us. If there's one thing that I didn't hear or that our audience didn't hear that you want to make sure they take away with them, what is that one thing that we need to take away? I wrote it down, I think. You know, I I um I wrote that down yesterday and I and I have since lost my piece of paper. Did you did you write it down, Taylor? Well, I, here's what I wrote down from you. We need to have the sense of awareness of where the conversation is going, how the engagement is going. We need to understand more about what Wanda is saying and why she is saying that or what Randy's saying. And then we need to figure out how to apply our response, our actions to what we just discovered. Yeah, that, that's and that, I mean. that's, you know, listen to each other and yeah. respond to what we've heard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very good. Look at that. K Karen said, excellent discussion today. Thank you, Karen. I appreciate I it. Was she thanking you or thanking me? And I said, <laughs> everybody. Yes. Yeah, I know. I'm playing. Everybody. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Wanda, I love you. Thanks a lot love for you. joining us today. Um, have a fabulous rest of the week. Randy, did you get anything out of this that you want to share? I did. And, you know, something something you said earlier in the show reminded me of, of something I try to coach clients about during interview situations when they get faced with a challenging, difficult interview question or, or an everyday conversation. And that is the use of a verbal cushion. It allows it allows me time to think about what I'm going to say. So that six second, you know, thing I can kind of deflate things a little bit. Um, it also acknowledges the question, uh, validating that it's a legit question that I'm going to address it. But also the key is it helps drop defenses. Yeah, right. And it could be I, I understand why you might ask that. Let me explain. And it just kind of lets the air out a little bit. And instead of that fight or flight, now it's a conversation versus how dare you ask me? Why'd you ask me that? That kind of thing. So for me, anyway, that's been a useful tool that I use frequently. Yeah, but again, that's just uh, that's just me. So, Teddy, that's it for that's, me on this. That's, that's good... all about that six second management of that amygdala little thing he's in the back of my head. <laughs> yeah, right back there, over there. So. Yeah. So, hey, Juan, again, thanks a lot. Thanks to our audience. Next week, Martha, Randy, are you? Are you, is it you and Martha, or, or me and Martha? Because we both know her well. I'll be with uh, Martha Larson next week. She is the director for the Forsyth Tech Small Business Center. We're going to learn all about how it got started, uh, who they serve, uh, are their costs, how do they raise their money. We're going to learn you know, faux pas in business. Uh, don't make these. Kind of thing we'll learn best practices and, and more. Martha Larson will join us on the 23rd. First time for her on the show, by the way. I don't yeah. think she's oh, this is a good one. And by the way, for our audience, these are free services. What Martha's going to talk about is free. It's funded by uh you know federal and state grants for anybody who wants to be in business. Thanks everybody for showing up. We appreciate our audience. Wanda, thanks a lot, dear. Randy, I will see you another day, big guy. Work. See you now. Bye bye. bye. bye.